Okay. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Polen Morebula. I'm the manager, natural science, standards development under standards division. I'll be your program director for today's event. And I would like to welcome all of you to the Cannabis Industry Workshop, which is aimed at establishing the National Technical Committee. We've decided to, to arrange for this workshop because we are planning to establish a National Technical Committee that will oversee the standardization initiatives for the cannabis and the hemp sector. To achieve this, we needed to have a relevant stakeholders who already have understanding about the sector as a whole and who will also contribute towards developing the national standards that will be used by South Africa. So that is the reason why we've decided to arrange for this workshop so that at the end of the workshop, we would ask um, the stakeholder in the room if they are interested in joining the committee so that we can start with the establishment of of this new committee that will cover the cannabis uh, industry. So without a waste of time, uh, I don't think I will ask each one of the participants to introduce themselves because the room is full. It's going to take us some time, but I'm accompanied by my colleagues from the SABS. I've got um, Matali Peter is the acting executive for, for Standards Division. He will also be doing a presentation. And I also have Tabo Tongwani, is the standard writer. He will be the responsible standard writer for Cannabis if we all goes well with the establishment of a committee and the development of the standards. I'm sure most of you uh, know Tabo because he's the one who's been uh, arranging this workshop. And I also have Veronica Malapani, who's also the team leader for, for the, the area, Cannabis. If we establish the committee, Veronica will be the team leader for the for the cannabis uh, committee. I also have Bjorn. Uh, he's the one who's been working closely with Tabo in arranging this workshop. I'm sure you've heard of him as well. So without a waste of time, I'll go straight to the program for the day, which is not that long. Uh, we have the first speaker on the program, uh, Mr. Gart Strachan from the Office of the Presidency. He will be doing the presentation around the sector development strategy, industrialization and commercialization of the hemp and cannabis industry. Uh, over to you, Garth. I, I trust that you are in the, the platform. You've joined the meeting. I haven't seen. Uh, see, God's not yet there. Maybe move to someone else. Oh, there's a hand going up. There's a hand. Hi, hi, so it can go ahead. No, hand is down. It's lowered, yeah. Okay. Tabo, have you had anything from Gar maybe this morning? Hi, Fallen. Uh, I haven't had anything from him at the moment uh, because uh, his presentation was scheduled for for a past nine, maybe he will join. Oh, because we still have five minutes before for yes, a past nine. Yes, yeah, yes. it could be. All right. Um, I, I don't know, Bjorn, maybe while we're waiting for Garth, we can use this opportunity to, to let each of our guests introduce themselves. Would that be we fine, can. Bjorn? A lot of, uh, I would also suggest people maybe if they want to, uh, to share their video screen. Uh, we will not okay. do that the whole time purely for the bandwidth, but for now to welcome everyone. It's nice to have everybody a little bit of faces there. If you want to, please share. Uh, I think that's a nice opportunity also. Okay, Th thanks Bjorn. Let me share mine first before I let everyone share. I think that's only fair. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Hi, everyone. <laughs> we can start with the SEPS colleagues and then, yeah. SEPS colleagues? 
Let me let me go first. I think you've introduced me already. Uh, good morning, everybody on the platform. Uh, my name is Matali Peter. As Pauline has already introduced me, and it gives us great pleasure to see so many people having turned up for this uh, for this workshop. We hope it to be a success. We'll be able to achieve what we uh, set out to achieve. Thanks. Thanks, Soli. Tabo. Okay, anyone else who's ready to introduce themselves? Good day, colleagues. Uh, my name is Tab. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see me because of the light behind me. Uh, like Fallen said, I'll be the responsible writer for uh, the technical committee. Thank you. Thanks, Tabo. Hi, yeah. I'm, I'm Bjorn Beist. I'm the marketing director for uh, SABS and assisting with the workshop at the moment from a technical side. Uh, and um, OK, so that's it. Sorry. I see there's more people coming in, so I'm pushing buttons and talking at the same time. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Bjorn. Our guests. Some chats are also coming in, people that are just uh, introducing themselves on the chat. Yeah, I can see that. Okay, I can see that the uh, participants have been muted. My apologies, I can unmute that. Oh, okay. It's from your side, Bia. Veronica? Uh, I see a hand from Abisha. Abisha, the floor is yours. I have enabled all the cameras and all the microphones. Uh, my apologies, it was a setting that is set from the beginning. We have just uh, opened up the, so everybody that wants to, I see some hands are up. Maybe just check that from following from your side. Uh, some people maybe wouldn't be able to uh, speak, but from our side, everybody has been enabled. Okay. Check. I only see a hand from Abisha. And it's not muted. Abisha? Okay. Sarah? Sarah and Abisha are muted beyond. I'm not sure if it's from your side or from their side. Okay, Sarah is unmuted. Over to you, Sarah. Hello. Uh, my name is Sarah Misi. I am based in Pumalanga. Um, uh, already in the in the in the space. We um, we are planting hemp currently, and uh, we're hoping to 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 get into cannabis in 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 a, in, in the near future. Um, and thank you for this workshop. I think it's uh, thank you, Sarah. You're I'm welcome. We're excited Thanks. about it. Thank you. And 
the time is now quarter past nine. Uh, Beyond, if you could just maybe acknowledge those that are still writing on the chat, just to, to acknowledge their responses on the chat box. I'm not sure if Garth is in the platform already. I can't see him. I follow Tabo. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Tabo. Yes, uh, I spoke to Garth just now. Um, he's actually in the building, so I'm going to, to fetch him. Oh, he came here? Yes. So oh. I'll be off for about five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Can I talk now? Yes, Abisha. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say I had been uh, muted, uh, both the camera and uh, and and voice but uh, now it looks like uh, i can communicate but obviously for the sake of the meeting i will switch off the uh, the camera thanks abisha thank you yeah it took a while before it uh, was enabled it uh, probably is a system that takes a little bit longer i see Sa sarah still hand up Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for introducing yourselves. I, I'm just we just waiting for Tabo just went downstairs to 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 get guard. So I don't know. We are still trying to arrange a room for him because we did not expect that he will come here, but he's already here in the building. Um, he's the first one on the program. So maybe we can start the workshop by moving to the next item on the program so that we don't waste time for other stakeholders that are already in the in the meeting. Um, Matali, are you ready for your presentation? Yes, I can start the presentation. Yes, maybe you can do that while we're waiting for Tavo to get Garth uh, to join the meeting. Then we will go back to Garth's item after your your presentation. So Matali right. will be doing presentation on behalf of Dr. Sadvi Bison. He's acting on his behalf. So you'll be doing a presentation on the role of standards and conformity assessments in the HEM and cannabis sector. Over to you, Matlale. Thank you very much. I've tried to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Uh, we can see it, but it's okay. still in a different mode. If you can put it on full screen mode. If you just, uh, uh, Peter, just unshare and then share again, but share uh, window. Go to share window. All right, let me unshare first. Stop sharing. Yeah, then I'm on the share window. And then. Share. Yeah. Thank you. Is it still? Is yeah, it better okay. now? Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, colleagues and everybody, our guests. Uh, as already introduced, my name is Matlali Peter. So I'm just going to go through It's a very short presentation. Uh, I've been given just 15 minutes to go through it, so I'll try to do so. Uh, let me start just by way of a reminder. It's not opening up. Oh, there we go. Uh, just, just, just uh, to remind all of us, the the objects of the SABS and what we exist for, because then this will inform even the discussions as they take place later on in terms of what exactly is the mandate of the SABS. Uh, so, based on the Standard Act of 2008, uh, we are responsible or we are mandated to develop, to promote, and maintain 
South African national standards uh, to promote quality in connection with commodities, products and services and render conformity assessment services and matters connected thereof. So you would notice that I've highlighted the first one, I've bolded it because this now talks to even the purpose of this workshop today, that what we are trying to achieve uh, with this workshop talks to that first, first part of our mandate, then the other parts would then follow uh, as standards are being developed. Uh, again, just quickly to reflect on the portfolio of services that the organization offers as a whole, uh, we do standards development. Uh, you would have access to standards and international standards, very, very important. We've got laboratory services, uh, many laboratories that we run. We do local content verification. Uh, some of you might already have attended training in our training center. We do that uh, consignment inspection as well as well as certification. So that will be the host of services that we offer. Uh, beyond, can't I do the presentation mode? This thing is frustrating me. I need to keep going back. Uh, so. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put it on the slideshow because I need to just move quick. It's it's frustrating me, but let me just carry on to see how far uh, I'll be able to go. Uh, then colleagues, we as the standards organization, we are involved uh, in regional and international committees. Most of you are aware that we are indeed a founder member of ISO and IEC, ISO being uh, our international organization for standardization and obviously IEC being the electrical, International uh, Elect Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, 165 member countries that are serving on ISO and increasing uh, 760 technical committees and SCs and we participate in quite a number of those committees of ISO. They've published about 22,000 500 and the latest are checked. I think they're approaching or have just surpassed 25,000 standards. So the relevance of this information, colleagues, is that as the SABS, we've got access to, to those standards. We are able to adopt them. You can access them uh, easily via the SABS. Same goes with IEC, 164 member countries and 34 technical committees. So there are not as many as the as the ISO site and over 9,000 IEC standards that they published. At the regional level. And Matale, sorry to, to interject. I, I don't yes. see your second slide. I'm still on the first slide. I'm not sure if other members could see the second slide. Are you still on the first one? No, I'm, I'm, I'm on slide number three. Uh, your I'm slides not sure. are not moving. Your slides are Yeah, you're still, still the first one. I don't know what's happening because uh, on my side. Peter, if you just click on the screen that is showing your uh, your big screen, click on that one and then yeah. use your arrows to go up and down. OK. Does it does it move now? Not yet. You have to select the screen that is that we are seeing that you are sharing. OK, I'm going to try that. I'm on it now. I've, I've clicked on the big screen that I'm yeah. sharing. And Can then see something now? And then with your arrows up and down. Yeah. Doesn't look like it's working. Maybe I'll stop sharing and try to share. Again. Oh, there it goes. It goes. It's fine oh, now. It's now going. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I was already up past this one. Uh, so I was here, um, and I'm very sorry about that, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, so I was on the regional regional committees or bodies that we are involved with. Uh, we are all, all also actively participating in the regional standardization organization, that's the African one, called ARSO. Uh, we serve in a number of committees, and I'll also, uh, uh, towards the end of my presentation, show you what work they have started doing in this field as well. We are also on the 
uh, Electric Technical uh, Commission, which is AFSEC, the African one. Uh, we are also actively participating in SADEX 10, which is our regional economic, uh, uh, our REC that we're serving on. And obviously, through ARSO, we do contribute to the continental free trade area. Uh, we are also colleagues involved in BRICS. We've got this body, it's more at an adversary level uh, when coming to standardization. So now and then we will align our um, thinking, our thoughts and our programs as to where we want to go at an international level as a body uh, supporting BRICS just from the standardization point of view. We are also part of PASC and the Commonwealth Standards Network where a lot of information is being shared. We participate there. We are members there. At the national level, when we bring it home, we are now over seven, seven and a half thousand standards that we published uh, on an annual basis. We've been doing on average 250 standards that we add to our catalog, 309 technical committees that we are currently uh, uh, administering, currently managing, and we've got, in fact, the number has increased over 2,000 experts who are participating in various committees that we have. Uh, in terms of the, the, in fact, I've spoken to this, but I just wanted to highlight, uh, sorry, very quick, just to highlight very quickly uh, one very important area which is now on representation and how our stakeholders um, uh, are categorized. Uh, industry associations that will constitute about 14% of our technical committees or in numbers, that will be about 241. Uh, those who are coming from their academia, a lot of our universities across the country are represented, our state-owned companies as well, about 2% uh, that are represented. Then. Obviously, per committee, per sector, you could then drill down and get the information on the number of standards that they published, who is participating in those committees. If you want to participate, what is the way to follow? But importantly, colleagues, you will see that at the bottom of, of my slide, I've got just that small uh, table there that jo shows gender distribution, that we are still backing in that field, where obviously a member of our committees will be an, organi on a, an organization, uh, whatever organization that becomes a member, either serving as a participating member of, or as an observer. But then we are encouraging these organization to say, can you please nominate or when you send now somebody to represent you, please work with us. We are trying to get more of a, a female representation in our committees. And the number is not looking very good. We've made strides last year, it has gone up. The, we are very happy that organizations and, and, and participants have heeded our call. And uh, I'm happy to say the latest number shows that we are approaching about 25% female representation, which is still not what we are targeting. Uh, then if I quickly go into the, the main presentation that I want to deliver, and start by this quote, which I like so much, that before standardization, or just about there, uh, there was this quote by this Hammurabi of Babylon, that if a builder built a house for a man and do not make its construction thin, and the house which he has built collapse and cause the death of the owner of that house, that builder shall be put to death. So others say that was a regulation. Others say no, that was standard. So that to then uh, uh, also talk to uh, the mandate of the SABS versus the mandate of regulators as we go along. Somebody then decided to be clever. Uh, I don't know who did this. This was shared with me uh, that it relates to our session today. That that quote by the Hammurabi was then slightly amended. To say if a, if a cannabis product producer does not comply with standards, again talking to regulations versus standards, during the manufacture of your product, then the product that she produced causes the death of a user. Such a user, such a producer shall be put to death. I don't know if that can still work. Uh, quickly, colleagues, then 
just to reflect on the benefits of standards and standardization, why it is important that we do this, what we want to do, is that standards provides a recognized solution to problems of national interest or what we could foresee as potential uh, 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 problems of national interest. It offers a high degree of acceptance because of the consensus process that we follow and the public consultation that is involved with standardization. Then if a regulator wants to say, I am going to rely on the standard for a technical solution, then a standard will offer you a high degree of acceptance. Health effectiveness as well. I've spoken about us being members of international forums, regional forums that we fought access to such standards. And I know a simple example that we always make when it talks to cost effectiveness of standards is that first, we don't reinvent the wheel. Secondly, just to get the standard, because if one were to say, we don't adopt international standards. So anybody who wants to use international standards, you can go directly and purchase it from us as the SABS, uh, as the local office of ISO or IEC. Then we'll sell it to you uh, in, you know, rent terms, but having converted that into, uh, from Swiss francs into local currency. For example, if let's say a standard sells for 100 Swiss francs, we will have to convert it into South African rents and sell it to you. But if it's an adopted standard, we sell it at our own cost because then ISO does not put a cap on what, how much we can sell it, sell it for, but just that we need to sell it for something. Uh, uh, besides the cost that gets involved, if we were to set up a working group, have experts coming here. I mean, the latest I checked is that professionals, like professional engineers, professional scientists, there are daily rates, you know, it's a lot of money. And if we were to take into account that if they were to sit for many, many, many meetings in committees, how much would that amount to just as a cost to you as an organization? Standards are constantly maintained. So there is already a system that says we have to keep them up to date. So we regularly review them, whether they are still relevant, whether they still serve the purpose that they were developed for or written for. They are also written in a style that supports uniform implementation. So going back to our builder, who built a house. So this builder could have said, but as far as I was concerned, I took all you know reasonable precautions, but standards are written in such a way that we can implement them without ambiguity. So we eliminate such ambiguities and that there will be no need for additional limitations in technical regulation. So sometimes I know regulators will talk about essential requirements of the regulation. So sometimes they would say, but you are falling short with your standards, so we're going to write additional requirements. So we are, write, we are writing them in such a way that there is no need for any additional limitations and that they are readily accessible, so I've spoken to them, and that standards ensure projects are safe and environmentally sound and fit for peoples. Uh, quickly going to uh, uh, continue with the benefits of standardization that standards are the lingua franca of global trade. So one is able to establish the criteria for assessing potential business partners and suppliers. Uh, colleagues, I think some of you who've been following this field knows that ARSO has published information that even talks to, you know, how many producers you have uh, across just, just our continent. So in Malawi, Zimbabwe, uh, 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 Lesotho, including South Africa, I mean Lesotho, they will tell you they did, you know, introduce some legalization to some extent, much as what we did as a country, as South Africa a couple of, a couple of years ago. Uh, so with that, with standards, you are also being able to know that if I were to look for a partner in Zimbabwe, they've got similar programs that are running. <clears throat> they also ensure the compatibility and quality of products and services. So if you were, we were to adopt a standard as a regional standard, uh, so it makes it easier for you to then move from one country to the other where the, there's that compatibility that we've, we've, we've developed. And it also helped to lower non-tariff trade barriers, which we could talk to later on. And most importantly, the standards serve as a knowledge base and catalyst for innovation. And also standardization is an essential element for the success of small and medium enterprises. Uh, 
then quickly just to go through this because I've already covered it, that standards ensure sustainability. We know that colleagues, this is an, an, a product that needs to be grown. It, 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 it needs to be taken care of. We can't just uh, uh, chop it off, process it, and not ensure that there's sustainability of such a product. And also the environmental protection that I've already spoken to. Then colleagues, this is the most important slice that for such presentations we always put forward to say, especially when we are looking into forming a new technical committee. If one were to go back not long time ago, just prior to 2008, while we're still operating under the uh, Standard Act of 1993, that SIBS was both the standards body and it also had regulatory powers that were then taken away from them. So you will hear people saying, but SABS, you are not enforcing your own standards, but standards colleagues as defined by the WTO is that its compliance with it is not mandatory. Standards are developed as, as voluntary in the application. Whereas technical regulation on the other side is that compliance with technical regulations is mandatory. So I guess colleagues, as we move forward, I would like us to always bear that in mind that when you sit together to develop a standard, know that it's my compliance with that. It's not mandatory. It is just voluntary. Uh, regulatory authorities, wherever possible, we encourage you to make use of national standards. Over 1100 South African national standards are referenced in regulations, national and local regulations to refer to standards for the same reasons or benefits that I've already illustrated in my earlier slides. And that we need to always also encourage regulatory authorities to endeavor to apply reference to standards method that respect the voluntary nature. That is just a subject for another time. So as soon as the committee has been established, colleagues will come back and unpack that uh, just to show you with, even with examples where this has not been done and it then starts to cause problems later on. We will talk to you about direct referencing. We'll talk to you about indirect referencing. We'll talk to you about dated referencing if you are a regulator and undated referencing, because then just quickly in one, one line, uh, we would say if you don't date your reference, like for example, a regulator could say, we need compliance with sense one, two, three, or any re or any amendment thereof. That colleagues would have its own pros and cons, uh, which one of the limitations that we've picked up is that regulators then tend to then uh, delegate their responsibility to technical committees. And in some instances, we've found that some of the technical committees would even write stuff into the standard that the regulator actually never intended for those to be written there, which then forces you as the regulator to go back and start amending your regulations to say, you know, we will go as far as this, not more. Uh, then colleagues, most of you are aware of this, so I'm not gonna spend too much time of it. The structure of, of committees, how we constitute committees that will have your main technical committee, which will cover a scope of work. Then you will have your subcommittees, where if your scope is very broad and might require a diverse range of stakeholders that you can break down into various subcommittees and obviously you will then have your working groups which are just you know a temporary structure that you just put there assign a task to them they put together a technical document they bring it back to you as a technical committee or subcommittee to, to deliberate to deliberate on uh, so on this, colleagues, I've noticed that my time is running off, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but this is very, very important going forward. Then obviously the principles that we follow as a standards body, which are followed at international level, regional level, and also at, at sub-regional level, that most important is consensus, transparency, your stakeholder engagement and coherence as well, colleagues. It's very important that of the 309 committees, we don't want one committee developing a standard, the other one develop a standard, and it seems to be to be contradicting what the other committee has done. Hence, it is so important that the scopes of committees don't overlap, including the scopes of documents that we develop. The due process, very important, we've got the norm, 
we've got the ARPs that we need to follow, openness, market relevance. Uh, so let me just go through them, uh, colleagues, very quickly. So transparency will be referring to shedding light on rules, plans, processes, and actions. And everybody needs to know that, knowing why, how, what, and how much, if there's any cost involved, that officials, managers, and technical committee members will act visibly and understandably and report on the activities. I know come across certain committees that say, but these people are not members of committees, so they shouldn't know about what we do when others who are outside are challenging what we do. And we say there's an issue of transparency. What we do, uh, somebody has used the term that we're not Freemasons. We don't keep our processes a secret. It, they need to be known. Uh, so what we do as SIDS, we follow known rules and procedures. We've published the national norm and the ARP, which the ARP say this, this is how you structure your document. This is what you have allowed to go into the document. This is what is not allowed. Then obviously our national norm will talk about how committees must participate. You will be, you'll be required to sign the code of conduct as a member of the committee that say this is how I'm going to behave, especially colleagues when you come into even issues of competition laws, what is that that you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Um, there's the, the structure for approving standards and project. We vote where voting is by TCs or SCs. That is an indication whether there, there is acceptance of what we, are, we want to put forward. And also we've got the governance of technical committees and you will hear my colleagues are referring more and more to SAC, SAC. So that is our standards approvals. Committee openness, I've spoken a little bit about that, where participation without discrimination must be available at every stage of the standard development process. So we don't say to you, when we established the committee, you were not interested. At every at, at time, an interested or affected stakeholder is allowed to join the committee, even when we've started the project and this organization sees that, but this project is gonna impact on our business, they are allowed to join. So we can't say to them, we are already at committee draft stage, so we're not allowing anybody to join the committee. As I mean, MMEs have spoken to that, uh, that they must be given meaningful opportunities to participate. Impartiality and consensus, uh, impartiality will then refer to innateness or fair mindedness, the decisions that are based on objective criteria rather than on the basis of bias, prejudice, or conferring the benefit to one organization over another for whatever reason. Colleagues, we moved away. If you take the standards that were written many years ago, that they were very much prescriptive. And over time, for many years, we've moved as the SABS where we write performance-based standards, uh, uh, you know, in as far as that is possible. Then consensus as well, uh, colleagues, that uh, others have confused consensus with the major majoritarian rule, where majoritarian says we've got 10 member of, members of the committee, nine of them say we agree with the standard, it's good enough, let it proceed. That the one member is then been told that majority are in agreement. We don't follow that process, colleagues. Even if that one member says I don't agree, that would, would mean that we've not reached consensus. Obviously, there are other processes like the appeals process that will then advise such a member to follow. But what is important is that if an appeal has then been launched, you are allowed to proceed with the document, but you will not be allowed to publish it until that appeal has been resolved and to make sure that it does not uh, uh, carry on forever. Uh, we've said as part of our norm that the CEO of the SABS will then have the final decision on an appeal. And when the CEO has then ruled, whichever way, then we are able to publish the document. Stakeholder engagement, very important. Uh, the necessity to involve players that may be materially affected by the standards implementation. We need industry, the government, consumers, and NGOs to be involved. That the role of members will also be complemented by direct engagement of relevant stakeholders. What we're doing today, colleagues, is not a once off thing. Uh, when a committee has been established, we will keep doing these uh, stakeholder engagement. And, uh, uh, as we're doing today. And then very quickly, uh, this uh, for some of you who have been involved with standardization, you're very familiar with this, but for those who are new in this uh, uh, standardization, 
uh, just to show you that standard will move from a proposal where there's a request for a standard. We will assess the market relevance of such a standard up to publication where it moves through various stages, the preparatory stage where we will put together a working group. It produces a working draft. We submit it to our TC or where an international standard exists. We put it to the committee and say, committee, we've come across this international standard. Will it serve our purpose? And they say, yes, it serves our purpose, which would then get us to, you know, our CD stage. We'll then go to the public and say, members of the public, you've got 60 days to comment on the standard. And if they say, yes, we are happy with it, we will then publish our final document. We will go through the editing. If it's a homegrown, even if it's a, an adopted standard, we will do that. And then on this call, if I may just also add one point that I know might come during your committee deliberations when the committee is being established. Please note that an American standard, a Canadian standard, a British standard, those are not international standards. They are just foreign national standards. And I'm mentioning this because as the SABS, we've got an obligation to the WTO, in fact, as a country, but the SABS as well would have a section that affects them where the, the WTO TBT agreement says that as a standardizing body, uh, we need to consider international standards before we do any other thing. So when a, when a person then say to you, but here's an international standard, then they present a, an American standard, please, they need to understand that in the application of the WTO TBT provision that is regarded as a foreign national standard that is at the same level as a South African national standard. So I thought I should just highlight that. Then uh, colleagues, there are protocols that we've signed like the SADC trade protocol that relates to standardization are so as well what we've signed or our ministers of trade have signed. And I thought just to to remind colleagues of this one, where the trade protocol, when it was signed in 1996, as it might then have been uh, amended from time to time, uh, our ministers of trade in the region made the statement that without reducing the levels of safety or of protection of human, animal or plant life or health, of the environment or of consumers, without prejudice to the rights of any member state and taking into account international standardization activities. Member states shall, to the greatest extent practicable or practical, make compatible their respective standards related measures so as to facilitate trade in goods and services within the community. As I said, we are heavily involved within some extent and also. So our ministers have committed that we need to do that. Uh, we also, uh, colleagues, committed through the rules of procedure of the harmonization of these uh, of standards within our region, some extent that uh, the we will adopt the harmonized text or standards as member states that we will demonstrate the commitment to adopting SADC harmonized text or standards as national standards, withdrawing conflicting national standards and facilitating the implementation of standards in their market. I've mentioned a number of countries within our region that are also in this field of cannabis and cannabis products, Lesotho, Zimbabwe, Malawi, uh, uh, just to mention a few. So competing standards obviously would just refer to national standards within the same scope and field of application as a SADC harmonized standard and with provisions such that conformity with the national standard is not conformity with the SADC harmonized standard or vice versa. Then just my closing slide colleagues to say what will then be the way forward from here, or at least just to reflect what we want to achieve. Uh, we want after this session at least to be able to establish a technical committee that will then handle this field of standardization. Uh, we also said colleagues, we've, we've looked around and we've not noted that our American counterparts here, ASTM, have got a committee and a various subcommittees covering uh, the full range of the value chain within this cannabis sector. 
they've published standards, they've established subcommittees, and we said we could benchmark with them and see which way to go. Could look into their publications that they've already published and see which ones can we adopt if they're relevant to us or where we need to develop our own homegrowns, uh, we could use them also as a benchmark. The, our ARSO colleagues, the regional standards body, has also be called for nominations in the working group that's going to be dealing with cannab cannab cannabis and cannabis products. But how we work as the SABS is that if you don't have a technical committee, it becomes very difficult to then participate in working groups. So currently, ARSO has then said the cannabis would then fall under the ARSO TC82. And this ARSO TC82 deals with African traditional medicines, and it is actually chaired by a, a, a candidate from South Africa and, and, and one of our own, Ms. Amanda Prabashi, chairs that committee. But whether that is the right committee for dealing with cannabis products, that will then be for you colleagues to deliberate. So what I was getting at is that it then becomes difficult if we don't have a local technical committee that is actually relevant to what we've been called to participate in like the working group for cannabis. That if we could nominate and say we nominate this person to represent us, but when this person goes to then participate in that committee, where will they derive their mandate? You know, even in working groups. So they will just be representing themselves. Uh, and they won't be deriving anything. But the unfortunate thing is that when a final standard is published by ARSO or any other body, ISO, IEC, is that they will say in the records that South Africa was represented. And you'll find that, but there was just this individual who just went there on their own. It becomes very difficult, at least when we've got technical committee, then it makes it easier. So I want to close the program director and, and encourage our participant to say, please uh, let's at least achieve the first one and have a technical committee so that we can take our rightful place in the ARSO uh, uh, technical committee that is also dealing with this. Uh, so they called us for participation in working group two, but that working group two of TC82 deals with cultivation, collection, quality, and safety of raw material. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, program director. Yes, I'm here. I'm actually. Thank you for for the presentation. And we were on item number two of the program. And uh, I was informed that Garth is in the call with Tabo. And we also have a presentation from Sapra according to our program, which was planned for for ten o'clock by Ms. Mohadi Fafudi and she requested this morning that she will only come at 10 and do the presentation and take questions and be excused due to other commitments. So when I look at the time now is seven minutes to 10 and Mohadi's already joined the has already joined the meeting and we also have uh, the first speaker who hasn't done his presentation. So I, from here, I will hand over to Mohadi to do his, her presentation, which will be the item number one, two, three, four, which is at the speaker number three, number four on the program, starting from 10 to quarter past 10. Then after Mohadi will go back to Mr. Garth. But before I hand over to Mohadi, I just want to check if there are any questions for the previous speaker, Mr. Matale, Peter, are there any questions for him? Maybe we can use that five minutes for questions, but we still have an item for Q&A, but we can use the five minutes for quick questions for Mr. Matale before we before I hand over to Ms. Mohadi. Any questions? Please raise your hand if you have any question. Veronica? 
Um, Fallen, I'm reading on the chats here from uh, Geneva. Um, she said, we have new members on our Sanku executive. Would it be possible to get a copy of Mr. Peter's presentation as it describes SABS's standards and technical regulations so well? Thanks, Fallen. It was just a, a request for the presentation. Thanks, Vero. Yes, all the presentations will be shared with uh, the participants after the, the session. All of the presentations will be shared. Uh, I see a hand from Dafara. Over to you, Dafara. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, my question is with regards to the committee, the selection of the committee. I'm not sure if I missed it when it was said. Um, what are the considerations or the requirements for a person to join the committee? Uh, Matali, would you like to respond to that? Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, when coming to technical committees, uh, uh, we don't really have much limitation. We just say if you are an affected stakeholder or if you are an interested stakeholder, you may join. Others may not be directly affected by the work of that committee, so they would say, but we want to observe. So you will choose to be an observer member. Uh, so as an observer member, you will get uh, uh, documents of the committee. Uh, if you want to comment, you can comment, but you've got no obligation to vote or respond. Uh, attendance of meetings, if you want to attend, you can attend, but there's no obligation on your part. But if you are directly affected and you elect to be a participating member of the committee, then there are certain obligations that we put on you. So you've got an obligation to attend meetings, to respond to documents that are sent to you. And then going to you know, various stakeholder categories, you will see that the normal always say, we, we, we prefer that you, you come through as an association. Uh, however, it's just a preference. So in a sector like this, you could say, but our organization would like to be represented. Uh, we will accommodate you. We don't we don't discriminate against that. We don't limit that participation. So you will see when the the membership forms are sent to you, you will then be given all of these options. Would you like to participate as a would you like to be involved as a participating member with this obligation or as an observer member? So you decide yourself. So from our side, we don't decide for you. The only time when we decide for you is if you're not then fulfilling your obligations as a P member. So you haven't attended two consecutive meetings, you don't respond to documents. We will then get back to you and say we're gonna we're gonna downgrade you to an observer. And when you're an observer, then you also know that others will then make decisions on your behalf. Uh, thanks very much. Thank thanks. you very much for the response. Are you covered, Tafara? Yes, thank you very much. Welcome. Any more questions? I'm sorry, if, if, if it's possible, if we can share a link on where you can click and um, join. For SABS. Sorry, Tafara, the link for? The link where you can get all the information, where you can also join to be a member or an observer. I'm not sure if it's on the SABS website or there's a link specifically for that. Matali, do you want to respond to that or can I? Yes, you may You may take that question, uh, Pauline. E Yes, we Tafara, we don't have the link for membership forms, but the, if you request it, we can send it to you. But after this session, we will just share the membership form with all the stakeholders that have joined this um, this meeting. OK, thank you very much. Veronica and, Tabo, Veronica and Tabo will share that with all of you. And if you are interested, you'll just complete the form and send it back to Veronica and Tabo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Veronica? Um, thanks, Pauline. I was just going to refer to a similar question on the chat from Yolandi. How do we get information on this committee? When will it be formed? How to participate ETC? So I think you've already answered that when we were answering the previous uh, uh, question. Thanks. Okay, Vero. 
Uh, the time is now 10 o'clock. So I'm going to hand over to Ms. Mohadi from SAPRA. She will be doing a presentation on the regulatory framework for medicinal use of cannabis. Just before uh, you start with your presentation, Mohadi, Bion wanted to say something regarding the poll. Bion, over to you just for a few seconds. Hold on, please. I'm just going to, I'm trying to, there's more people that I'm admitting at the moment. Give me a sec. If there are still more questions for Matlali, you can still put them on the chat box. Then we will try and address those comments at the end of the session. So there's a, a little poll that we've got in the meeting chat. If you uh, would like to answer that, we'll give you a minute. It's something just from our side to get some information. So you just fill in whatever you feel and and submit this is completely there's no names registered or anything thank you very much and we're just going to give it a few secs i see a lot of people are already doing it it's just to gauge our interest <laughs> Uh, you can do that in the meeting chat. We've got about 20 responses. Thank you. I'm giving another few seconds. Okay. I see there's a hand from Zikali. Zikali, just please go ahead with your question. Oh, the hand is lowered. Just a few more seconds, then we're going to hand over to Mokhadi. Yeah, I'm going to close the, the poll. Thank you very much for everyone's participation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bion. Uh, Mokhadi, you can go ahead with your presentation. I, I, I was made aware this morning that you said you did not prepare the actual presentation, but you'll obviously be able to take us through the regulatory framework for medicinal use of cannabis without uh, giving us the actual presentation, but just giving us some information with regards to, to that item. Over to you, Mohadi. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning to all the attendees, and thank you very much for the invite. My name is Mohadi Defni Fafudi. I head the regulatory compliance unit of SAPRA and uh, I will be just taking you um, because of the few minutes. To, uh, the presentation is longer than the time that it will take, but I'm just going to be very quick and then we'll uh, answer the questions where uh, there is no clarity. The South African Health Product Regulatory Authority exists in terms of the Medicines and Related Substances Act. Uh, Act 101 of 1965. And the main mandate of SAPRA is to ensure that all the medicines that are in the country are of quality, safety, and efficacy. So uh, what I will be speaking on, just remember that it will be pivoting around the quality of the uh, products that should be uh, registered, authorized, or available uh, through SAPRA. Uh, so they must be of quality, they must be efficacious, meaning that they must perform what they are supposed to be performing, and then they must be safe for the public to consume. So uh, my area, uh, we are responsible for, uh, in terms of cannabis in particular, or cannabinoids. So we are involved in the licensure, the permits, the inspections, and also um, within SAPRA, we do a product authorization. As we know at the moment, 
uh, there are no registered products that contains um, the cannabinoids, which people are mainly interested in uh, as medicines uh, when they refer to them as a cannabis product. But we need to also understand the background on how cannabis and cannabinoids are regulated. So uh, cannabis is classified in terms of the, the, the United Nations conventions and it is classified under the UN Convention on Narcotics, which is the 1961 Convention on Narcotics, the 1971 Convention on Psychotropics, and also the 1988 Convention, which intends to prohibit illicit trade in narcotics and psychotropic substances. So South Africa is a member state, and therefore member states need to ensure that there are regulations in place to control. So they do not dictate, however, but member states need to ensure that they are to overlook it. And we remember that uh, in, nine, in 2018, the Concord judgment declared that it is unconstitutional to pre prevent adults in their own space, um, in their private space, a private use of uh, or possession of um, cannabis for for their private consumption. So, and therefore the section of the Drugs and Drug Trafficking Act that was affected is the one that is displayed together with the Medicines Act. You would remember that we had classified cannabis under Schedule 7, meaning that it was not available for use uh, in the exception of research. And hence, uh, we needed to make some amendments, which from SAPRA and Health, we did and and um, we reviewed the framework as well. And also what we did is that we, we therefore classified uh, different strains, like for example, when it comes to t uh, THC, uh, which is the psychoactive component, because that is mainly what the UN conventions are speaking of. So the main cannabinoids that people are, uh, were currently interested in were the Delta-9 THC contained the CBD. So this too, uh, therefore, uh, in terms of our scheduling, we further uh, zoomed into them and then we removed the inscription of cannabis from our schedules. Then we dealt with THC as the substance that and also CBD. So that's how we reviewed our schedule. And we, as we have re therefore uh, also as a consequence, we therefore also released hemp, which is a low THC cannabis, and we define that as containing less than 0.2%, which I'll come to. So we are enabled that so that those who want to cultivate hemp for other purposes, for example, industrial, for cosmetics, for food, for any other purpose other than medicines, then they can uh, therefore be able to access that. Then the Department of Agriculture is responsible for regulating hemp. And um, this, there were several engagements and platforms where this uh, consultation took place for us to reach that. And in terms of the international reporting, although we have to be reporting on how we are managing this in our uh, respective countries. So before the beginning of the year, we need to have estimates of how much South Africa will be consuming in terms of THC containing products, Delta 9 THC. We need to uh, inform the INCB what it will be used for. They want to know from birth to death. For example, we need to say how much area we will be cultivating. When we cultivate that, how much we will be producing and of what we will be producing, what will those produce be converted into in terms of finished products and what is the purpose of those finished products? And remember, um, um, from SAPRA side, we are speaking about um, medicines or health products. So then we need to, to say what are they treating and where are these uh, patients? And then so we need to account up until the end and this, to say how much was manufactured, how much uh, of those finished products were waste and then what did we do with that waste so that is uh, we, we we report that on a quarterly basis as well and also annually and at the beginning of the year we need to get um, the quota so 
here I have also just summarized some of the um, engagements and platforms that we have been involved in. We are very active in all the platforms that speaks about cannabis. Um, and we know about the cannabis master plan, which the Department of Agriculture is uh, leading. And they will be speaking more on that. We are also a member. And how did we, as I said, that this is how we, we amended our schedules. So we said THC, which is uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, will be listed in Schedule 6. However, if it contains uh, less than 0.2%, we will not regulate it. But CBD is listed in Schedule 4. If that CBD contains less, um, um, uh, which um, if it contains the, the products that are of health, but they are just saying that they, these are low dose in general health claims, where they contain a sales pack of 600 milligrams or less, not making any medicinal claims, like it's not curing, but it says, for example, it's only for general health and men enhancement, or it maintains um, good health, for example, it can be allowed if the maximum daily dose is 20 milligram, then it will be a schedule not, meaning that we do not have to uh, regulate uh, it like a medicine. And also, um, if it is a processed product not containing more than that in its naturally occurring form, it will be excluded. But where medical claims are made, it will be treated as Schedule 4 and it will have to come to SAPRA for evaluation if it says it cures cancer, for example. Then um, what uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture will speak more about the hemp, uh, how they are currently handling hemp because we are no longer handling hemp unless the CBD contained in that will be used for medical purposes. But um, as we know, there are many industrial use um, or other purposes other than medicines that are used by um, the, the, uh, hemp, hence we are no longer regulating it. So in terms of um, the, that is uh, in terms of THC, uh, Schedule 6 substances are the highest listed and regulated substances. Uh, Schedule 7 are banned substances. So Schedule Six substances require a doctor's prescription and they must be obtained from a pharmacy or from a, a place that is authorized by the Department of Health, like a clinic that is authorized to do that, or even doctors who are given that option to okay. dispense. Then, okay, um, so the SAPRA framework, we, li we license um, facilities and in terms of licensure, we license facilities for cultivation, for manufacture or distribution for medical and scientific purpose. So I will just give you an example of um, the number of uh, licenses that we have issued to date. So we have received over 300 applications and we have issued 84 licenses for cultivation and three licenses for manufacture. So these 87 licenses that are, have been issued uh, to date by SAPRA, which demonstrated that there is a market and they will be able to uh, provide what their market requires. And that is in line with international conventions. And um, because remember, there are quality standards for, as I indicated, that we need to make sure that we protect uh, the public. So in terms of, um, okay, yeah, as I indicated, 87 licenses issued, and um, we also issue permits for research. And what is so far, so far we have um, successfully exported to countries like Canada, Zimbabwe, Germany, and many, many more. We are still um, excited. I will take questions. Thanks, Mukhadi, um, for, for the presentation. 
Veronica, could you please assist with the question in the chat box? And if there are any more questions for Mohadi, you can please raise your hands. Then we will take those questions before Mokadi leaves the platform. I see a hand from Geneva. Before you, Vero, let's give Vero, uh, Geneva a chance to ask question. Geneva, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to ask one question. In the, the lead up to the legislation changes for hemp and cannabis, um, there was lots of talk about um, indigenous um, uh, species being used. I'd like to ask if any of our indigenous species uh, have made the cut as far as SAPRA is concerned and whether it, they are going to be used for uh, medical purposes. Um, the reason I'm asking this is a lot of the cannabis oil produced at the moment has been produced not in scientific labs, it's being produced in people's back gardens and their kitchens. Um, and they're obviously using indigenous plants, uh, which I'm led to believe are far more potent. But um, if I could get answers to those questions, I'd be very happy. Thank you. Over to you, Mokadi. Thank you. Um... So, Jennifer, in terms of um, the medical papers, we haven't received submissions relating to those papers of authorizations or re registration. However, there is also a route of research, as I mentioned, that we also do uh, issue research, but mainly the research has been given to the uh, science institutions that have got uh, research capabilities because we need to account to who are we giving um, the research permits to. So, and maybe um, agriculture can respond to that, but for medical purpose, we do not have um, um, the submissions that relates to this um, in terms of the indigenous uh, species, unless if those that are working with the universities that we have issued and research institutions that such as the CSIR, for example, unless those falls within this. However, we do not have. But what I know is that um, there are um, uh, various academics who are conducting research. We have issued over 300 research um, permits. No, no, sorry, not 300, over 30 um, permits uh, for research, which are currently underway. But um, we can consider that there is that provision. However, it has to be supported by capabilities of co conducting research. Thank you. Thanks, Mokhadi. Uh, the next, Veronica, I'm not, I, I can't see the hands. Could you please assist me with that? The hands and the questions in the chat box. Thanks, Pauline. Um, I don't know if you're going to take my hand first, but then um, I saw that the Boho had the hand raised as well. So should I go first or will you give the Boho a chance? Let me give the Boho a chance. Okay, it's the Boho for Pani. Uh, yes, hi. Um, nice to meet you guys and hi, Daphne. Thank you for joining on this session. Um, just a quick one. Um, I think some of the questions are actually on the on the chat box, but the the main emphasis that we were trying to ascertain uh, is regarding the the safety measure that you've put in place when you said that um, twenty milligram um, has been set from that point of view. Um, I think you've been asked these questions a lot of times, as you know. Um, but the question would be then, in this case, um, have we finally get to the point where we can rationalize this or are we going to be able to move the needle at least to accommodate uh, what has been requested uh, for quite some time now regarding that um, dosage uh, as a limitation? Over to Mohadi. Thank, thank you, Mohadi. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Deborah. So what we are currently um, 
Uh, as I indicated that we are available on, on various platforms that of cannabis because we want to form part of the solutions that are needed. So we are currently reviewing our schedules, but in line with the data that is available, because what we are what we have been asking is that can we have the supporting information that says uh, this is not practical because some of what when we review our schedules, we use data in line with um, our because remember there are other regulatory authorities or agencies that we are working with uh, where we consult with and uh, we use um, a, a similar data to come up with certain um, resolutions. So or amendments required. So hence we were saying that if there is um, supporting data that what we have is lower than uh, what is um, the norm or what is uh, applicable in South Africa, then we will be happy to use that information to support the amendment. So like for example, there is a complaint regarding the THC levels and we are currently uh, reviewing working with various institutions just to review some available data. So that is supported by um, research data or any other data. Hence, we are giving research permits for those who wish to conduct, because this is still a new industry for many, and we are still navigating through it to see how best we can come up with the uh, solutions. But at the moment, um, CBD, we still need supporting information. But when it comes to THC, there are some of the considerations that are at the moment being uh, looked at. Like today, we will be having a meeting um, with uh, relevant stakeholders that will be presenting to us some information relating to THC. So if there is more information available, we would look at it. Thank you. Can you still hear me? I think Veronica, you can ask yes. your question. The okay, program director, thanks. you muted. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Veronica. Okay. Um. Thanks. Oh, um, sorry, Michael. I was on mute. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Vero. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Uh, I actually have three questions that I've picked up from Ayanda Bam. So I don't know, uh, out of the three questions, I think the second one has been answered. So I'm just going to ask the two. Um, the first one being, uh, which part of the Act provides SAPRA the mandate to oversee cannabis cultivation? Which part of the Act provides SAPRA the mandate to oversee cannabis cultivation? That's question one. Um, and then the second question, it was also saying what standard or scientific basis informs the 0.2% THC threshold established by SAPRA? And the same question for the CBD uh, thresholds. I think you answered that when you were answering the BOHO. And the last question says, when you say SAPRA is not regulating hemp, just confirming that this means someone can grow hemp flower for any purposes under the Dalrat permit with the end user responsible for being compliant with the Medicines Act if they extract CBD from it. Thank you. Did you get all the questions, Mohadi? Yes, I got them, ma'am. So, okay, okay thank you. Um, so, and as so at the moment, the uh, SAPRA together with the Department of Health, we are responsible for overseeing the narcotics and psychotropic substances. And uh, as I have indicated, that we are also the reporting authority to the uh, International Narcotics Control Board or the UN in terms of the conventions that I have indicated. So, and all member states need. So SAPRA, uh, on behalf of health, is doing that. 
or together with health is doing that. And these are these provisions are also there in the act when it comes to narcotics and psychotropic substances, uh, where it it speaks about we, we they are specified schedule five and schedule six substances. So as I indicated that uh, cannabis that contains more than 0.2 percent it falls under Schedule 6, and when it falls under Schedule 6 for medical purposes, then that's when, hence, I always uh, go back to medical purpose. So, and this is, um, uh, uh, maybe let me give an example of um, uh, of what it contains and because of what the intention is, hence it comes to SAPRA. But if it is for recreational or any purpose, regardless of what it contains, we do not regulate that, hence uh, the cannabis bill. So my focus is on medical purpose and because it contains high percentage of THC, so that's what we need to inform the INCB on and to say that this is how much will be cultivated. Uh, that's how in and also section 22c of our act make uh, uh, section 22c 1b of our act may make provision for that um so when you cultivating and going to produce a point more than 0.2 thc then we are coming for that scheduled substance that we will for me i be overseeing uh, what the activities are, are taken. But do, if it is not medicinal, we do not come in. And also with the uh, hemp, as I indicated, that when it comes to CBD, if you are, if your interest is in the medical field, remember, if you are saying you're going to sell a product for patients, then you are producing a medical product or a medical API, we, that's where we come in because uh, that pro, uh, it is regarded THC uh, in terms of, um, as I indicated, that uh, high levels of THC have got psychoactive components and all the member states need to account to the INCB. Up until uh, the process of the master plan or even, yeah, in this instance, the master plan is the one that is best positioned because all the stakeholders when it comes to cannabis uh, should be represented there. So that is where a policy decision can be taken. At the moment, SAPRA only focuses on its mandate, which is medicine. So I'm, I'm responding to why we are controlling cultivation to say in relation to uh, THC, that's what we are expected to do. Um, when it's more than 0.2% and when it's for a medical product. But uh, CBD is not internationally controlled, hence uh, the hemp uh, is uh, now uh, in agriculture. But the moment you say you want to produce medicines uh, from CBD, which will cure cancer, which will cure pain, uh, severe pain related to then in that instance, we need to review that product. It for, then it will fall uh, within um, SAPRA. Thank you. Thank you, Mokadi, for the responses. I see that we are not doing good on time. It's almost half past 10 now, and we still have four more speakers. And according to the program, the workshop is scheduled until 11 o'clock then there will be a Q&A session, then a summary which is planned to be concluded by half past 11. And it's now half past 10. And I see on the chat box, there are still lots of questions in the chat box, Veronica, and there are still a couple of hands raised. So Mohadi, are you gonna stay in the platform until the end of the session or are you planning to leave the meeting now? Uh, Chair, I um we there is a um we are currently uh, en en engaging in our, in a post market surveillance program that we are developing. So I am actively uh, it is my unit that is running that project. So unfortunately, I'm not available, but I will be happy to take questions that um I can maybe later respond to through you. 
uh, email, but uh, we are willing to be part of the forum that you were suggesting going forward. We can have a representative from SAPR. Okay, that was actually going to be my proposal to say how about we take all the questions and uh, forward them to you after the, the session by email, then you can respond to, to the stakeholders by email. So that would be fine from your side. Uh, with the stakeholders that have questions in the chat box and those that have raised their hands, could you please send all those questions to Veronica and Tabo? Then we will forward the questions to, to Mohadi after the session. Then you will be she will be able to respond to each of those questions. And if obviously we are going to establish this committee for cannabis, those questions can still be brought to the table because Mohadi is going to be one of our stakeholders anyway in that committee. Will that be fine with everyone who had questions? Just by a show of a hand, then we can move on, move on to the next item. Thank you, Ayanda. Thank you, Moloto. Going back to our thanks, Mohadi, for, for the presentation and the responses to the questions asked. Thank you for the opportunity and look forward to more engagements. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Mohadi. Going back to our program, we are on. Let me just quickly share the program with all of you. We skipped item number two of the program, which was going to be done by Mr. Garstrasen. He has joined the meeting. So we were now on item number five of the program by Mohadi. So now we're going back to item number two of the program, which is um, sector development strategy, industrialization and commercialization of hemp and cannabis industry by Mr. Garst Strachan. Then when he's done, we'll go to Ms. Dr. Sichaba, which will be the next item after Mr. Garst Strachan. Mr. Garth, over to you. Um, uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. I apologize uh, for being late. Uh, some of us were under the false impression that it was both a virtual and a physical um, meeting. And so we came to the SABS uh, campus. Um, and uh, so apologies for that. Um, I am uh, just to introduce myself, employed by the project management office in the presidency. Uh, Delred is obviously um, the lead department. Um, and so um, under Dr. Uh, Julian Yafta, and so, um, uh, uh, you know, we are doing uh, supportive work from the project management office and operation Vulindlela. So in the 15 minutes, I'm going to have to go through this presentation quickly. Uh, we all know the cabinet decision of 2019 and the global growth projections, which uh, uh, are very significant. I'm not going to go through that in detail. Uh, we are of the view that the supply side interventions, hemp and cannabis permits and licenses have provided constrained gateways for investment, uh, which has been important, but uh, with unintended uh, negative consequences. Uh, we are of the opinion, and this needs to be uh, validated by mining the data itself from the licenses and permits that have been issued, uh, that there's a market failure, that there's stranded assets, that there's oversupply and dumping of primary product uh, on the illicit market, uh, ironically blowing black legacy farmers out of the water, and that the existing regulatory framework excludes black legacy farmers and growers in rural areas. Of course, we're not alone. I want to make the point that some country comparators are also grappling with regulatory reform and an evidence base, but other countries have secured early move advantage 
up to and including adult use uh, regulation. So I think we must be careful not to compare us with the lowest common denominators of regulatory reform and sector growth. And sometimes we adopt very defensive positions. How do we uh, pose the questions? How do we characterize the problem in order to craft solutions? And the workshop question for me is what is the role of product process standards in the sector development program? And I have to say uh, slightly mischievously that it was a view for me at a workshop very similar to this one almost to the day three years ago and frankly very little progress has been made. Uh, I think defining the problem there's regulatory and legislative uncertainty and that is inhibiting investment, employment, creation and sustainable rural livelihoods. Uh, Intra-government and inter-institutional knowledge and information asymmetry exists uh, on a very significant scale. Uh, and this is impacting implementation uh, and slow progress. The nine departments with legislative, regulatory and implementation functions. Then uh, I think the regulatory uh, asymmetry uh, is reflected in the fact that we don't have an adequate scientific and economic evidence base for regulatory reform. Uh, and uh, they are, you know, very constrained and dedicated financial and human resource capacity uh, that has been assigned to this work, despite the fact that it's one of the 14 priority sectors. Just to give you an example, Argentina has dedicated 106 million US dollars to its sector development program. I have had to beg and borrow funding from various sources to do some of that work. The absence of a research evidence base for a country competitive strategy is absent. South Africa cannot compete across all parts of the value chain. Where is the revealed advantage for a country competitive approach? We can't simply assume that we're going to jump in on the supply side. You know, economics tells you, in fact, that you should probably start on the demand side and work backwards. Uh, I think South Africa's industrial science and innovation effort is strong. The critical question, or relatively strong, is how do we make it central to a country competitive strategy? Uh, and technology mapping and transfer requires attention across all the demand pathways. Um, I, I get really worried when regulators say that they rely on uh, submissions for scientific research. Uh, SEPRA has, and forgive me if I'm making a mistake here, I'm happy to be corrected, as uh, what I refer to as evaluator medical research. But who is doing the medical scientific research if we say regulatory reform has to be uh, a built on a foundation of economic, uh, legal and scientific uh, work. Legacy growers and indigenous knowledge communities have been excluded and we think a whole plant, all legitimate purposes approach should be used. I know that colleagues uh, have uh, some mm, questions about what actually constitutes legitimate and that's a debate that we have to be having. Regulatory administration must be transparent, fair and efficient across all the regulatory institutions, in addition to being buttressed by evidence-based approach. And the need for a national standards and conformity assessment framework is uh, clear, and uh, Peter has spoken to it. Uh, my own view, which I'll speak to in a second, is that it should be focused perhaps on the mid and downstream manufacturing sector uh, uh, for obvious reasons. Then colleagues, um, in our approach in supporting uh, Delrad, 
uh, we want a whole plant approach. The medicinal demand pathways are African traditional medicines, registered medicines, and dispensing pharmacy model and complementary over-the-counter medicines. The industrial demand pathways are cosmetics, human and animal food products, and industrial um, applications. And then, uh, you know, as we build a country competitive strategy, which lowers the very high regulatory burden at the moment, is evidence-based, is scientific research-based. Uh, we regard the pillars one as an economic research evidence base for revealed advantage, and the key departments are listed. Secondly, a medical science evidence base uh, for evaluatory medical science and uh, for regulatory reform, and I list the departments. Three, an industrial science and innovation base, where we need to scope the technologies across the value chain and focus on technology transfer and catalytic projects, forgive uh, the spelling mistake, and uh, the departments are listed there, and I won't go through them in the interests of time. And then, firstly, uh, private and public sector financing support, uh, which means research, design and implementation, and especially investment support in catalytic projects for inclusive growth. Five, enabling regulatory reform and legislation. In other words, an enabling pathway specific regulation for investment and inclusive growth and appropriately constrained for societal harms. Uh, and then number six, a standards and conformity assessment framework uh, for where applicable for the demand pathways. And obviously the point that was made earlier by Peter, which is that we mustn't confuse standards and conformity assessment with a regulation. So colleagues, we've set in place a process for uh, economic research. Uh, this is uh, uh, leaning on the DTRC for funding. This is a limited budget and further uh, funding is required for deep dive economic research. In the President's Sona, he said uh, that there had been an instruction for the reprioritization of budgets to support uh, the hemp and cannabis sector. Financing framework, we've appointed, again, leaning on the DTRC to uh, undertake uh, work in relation to, uh, for one of a better word, I'm calling blended financing from uh, the private sector, uh, public uh, support and the DFIs and the IDC already has a fund and is uh, hopefully will play a significant role. And then um, regulatory reform, uh, we've secured funding and hopefully will appoint a, a team to do an overarching hemp and cannabis legislation. Obviously, there has to be an engagement with uh, mindful of the separation of powers with uh, the National Assembly where the Cannabis for Private Purposes Bill is uh, currently in uh, process, and that's uh, obviously an adjacent piece of legislation which we need to keep an eye on. We're doing work in relation to mine rehabilitation, the carbon economy, and environmental management. And so this slide is very busy. Uh, uh, the, it's headed the development of an evidence-based, regulatory enabled, inclusive and pro-poor hemp and cannabis country competitive strategy. The legislative and regulatory reform is uh, the Cannabis for Private Purposes Bill, a shorter term and urgent regulatory reform, which the president has instructed should take place. And then all plant whole uh, purposes uh, whole plant, all purposes, sorry, that's a mistake, uh, for uh, uh, all the demand pathways. Uh, the economic uh, research value chain uh, upstream of the farm gate uh, and primary production, Delrad, downstream, midstream and end user, uh, the DTRC. Uh, and I've spoken to uh, the financial instruments and uh, we need a deep dive 
look at competitive advantage in subsectors. We need a science-based research, which is industrial, uh, uh, DSI and CSIR, medical science. Um, I'm trying to meet the uh, MRC in this regard. Agricultural science, which falls under uh, the Delrad AOC agricultural institutions and standards and conformity assessment. This work will report through Delrad to an executive interministerial committee or EOC executive oversight committee. We are putting in place research management and oversight, and there obviously has to be a very close collaborative, and again, sorry for the spelling glitch, uh, implementation by departments working with the private sector, labor, and communities. Then, colleagues, this is a very stylized example. I've put it up because um, the of all the sectors, uh, industrial agro-processing sectors, the hemp and cannabis sector is very complicated by virtue of the number of departments and institutions involved, by virtue of the complex regulation for each of the specific demand pathways and the standards that are applied. This is, I'm calling it stylized because it's not complete and at some point in uh, working together with all the departments, we need to uh, make sure that that is completed. And so um, at the master plan level led by the um, Delrad, uh, we, we are supporting each department. Uh, we need to try to move away from high level, um, you know, um, targets to practical, doable, time-bound, uh, sequenced uh, interventions uh, across uh, departments. And uh, I've already spoken to the IMC, the Research Steer Co. Just to say, we are also working with provincial governments and stakeholders. Uh, I'm struck by uh, one thing, that the dynamism of the private sector uh, is very significant and um, sometimes we have to recognize that government stands in the way of investment, uh, job creation and inclusive growth. Uh, and that's uh, something that we need to take care of very, very carefully. To turn to um, the regulation and standards, and I missed part of Peter's um, presentation. Uh, standards and conformity assessment decisions, in my understanding, rest with importing countries and voluntary adoption by commercial companies. Nevertheless, standards and conformity assessment plays a very significant role in the domestic economy and in global trade. Uh, the existing highly constrained export demand pathways for medical cannabis, dry flower and, and derivatives is circumscribed by EU, GAP, GMP, GAC, P, GA, HP and other conformity assessment. Uh, I would argue uh, that the EU appears to be insisting on uh, conformity assessment institutions of their choosing in South Africa. Uh, and uh, this is something that we need to take up very strongly. And in my understanding, there are 17 accredited laboratories to provide certificates of analysis uh, for uh, export pathways. SEPRA has equivalence agreement with key export markets, in my understanding, and SEPRA will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but commercial offtake companies, which are a condition of SEPRA licenses, have the right and in some cases appear to insist on EU accredited and specified conformity assessment, which is a uh, added cost to uh, producers and exports. EU standards frame for indoor and they impose high regulatory barriers and I would argue non-tariff barriers. South Africa's competitive advantage lies in outdoor with the potential for inclusive growth which should secure climate change mitigation support. Um, so colleagues, 
in conclusion, infant industry new sector development is very difficult to achieve and market failures are commonplace. South Africa doesn't have a great record. We tried to develop a biofuel subsector. We tried to develop a renewable um, component manufacturer subsector. And frankly, uh, we didn't do very well at all. As I've said, the hemp and cannabis sector has enormous complexity, a large number of departments and institutions with functional responsibility and the numerous demand pathways which each require enabling um, investment friendly regulation. I think somehow other a slide was missed out. Uh, I don't know what's happened, there's a glitch, but uh, the demand pathways, uh, which I set out in another slide, which seems to have uh, fallen away, is um, obviously registered medicines, um, uh, um, uh, complementary medicines, uh, cosmetics, human and animal ingestion, African traditional medicine, and um, the uh, multiple industrial applications. And each of those require uh, pathway specific regulation and uh, they often require um, uh, standards uh, specific to those regulatory pathways. Some international standards uh, which already exist and standards which, for example, are used in, uh, in the America, the ASTM has 37 standards uh, ranging, and I lift some of those, indoor and outdoor cultivation, quality management, processing and handling, diversity, equity and inclusion. Diversity and equity inclusion has to be central in all the sectors, uh, including in relation to hemp and, and cannabis. And I think that's a hugely important uh, uh, issue. The development of sands should be a priority. As I said, we started this process three years ago. I'm not clear why the progress has been slow. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to be asking the question, what is the support that is required for the establishment of the appropriate technical committee or committees uh, for the development of these priority sands? And obviously uh, the work in SADC and in ASO is important, but countries are moving ahead at speed and South Africa's competitive advantages are clear. We need to support this process with regulatory reform, with standards, and as somebody said, with our competitive advantages, which include land race strains uh, and uh, uh, outdoor uh, production, inclusive production. So colleagues in the time available, um, that's my uh, slide presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Garth, for the presentation. I see there is a hand already from Radia, but I'm going to ask that we move on to the next item, Radia and other stakeholders. Then we will take all the questions under the Q&A item of the program. Please pack all your questions, then we will uh, address them when we get to the last item of the of the program to to save time. I see we are not doing good in terms of time. So the best way to be for us to conclude the program and then handle the questions at the end of the program. I hope that you will not forget your your questions. Thank you. Moving on to the next item on the program. It will be item number four of the program. And the topic is the National Cannabis Master Plan for South Africa by Julian Jafta from Dalrat. Julian, over to you, Dr. Julian. Dr. 
Dr. Julian? Dr. Julian, can you hear me? Tabo, did you hear anything from Dr. Julian this morning? But I, I saw she she joined the meeting. Hi, Fallen. Um, Hi, Tabo. He was on he was on call, uh, but uh, I can't see him now. Mm. I'll I'll have to check up. Okay, then without a waste of time, then we will move on to the next item on the program, which would be um, sustainable and responsible use of cannabis. We we don't have CSIR uh, in the platform. They've apologized. They couldn't make it to this uh, engagement, but we've requested um, Shiba Cannabis Academy to also cover the testing part of the cannabis product, which the presentation will be done by Mr. Trenton Birch and Mr. Deborah Khopani. Mr. Trenton, over to you. Hi, we just need uh, permission to share our screen, please. Beyond, could you please assist with that? They need permission to share their screen. Yeah, I'm gonna go quick, hold on. See why they're not. Thank you. Apologies, uh, apologies, Colin. While, we uh, hi, while we were talking, um, Julian raised the hand. I think he was still on the call, but he was muted. So I believe he was ready, but you were, you, you were speaking at the time. Oh, he, yeah, he just wrote something on the chat box that he's ready. Uh, sorry about that, um, Mr. Trenton. No problem, we will go ask. back to Dr. Julian to do his presentation, then you will be the next after after him. Sorry no about problem. that. No, Dr. No Dr. Julian, over to you. Um, Chair, uh, good morning. My, my apologies. I I just had to step out. The meeting went on a bit longer, so I quickly had to deal with another another matter. Chair, I just want to be be clear that um, it's not my area of of expertise in terms of standards development or the process attached to it. So I wasn't sure what kind of presentation this forum would 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 require. And given that there was an overview of the cannabis master plan, um, I just then um, step or uh, focus on where we are in terms of the the regulation of of hemp pr production. If I could just get an indication if the slides are moving, did they move? Yes. Uh, okay. Sure. So um, j just briefly, and not to take over, I'm not going to cover every uh, point on these on these slides. But just to say that um, we are currently using existing legislation in, in the form of the Plant Improvement Act to, to regulate the, the, the production of hemp. Um, the Plant Improvement Act is um, existing legislation, as I've said, that really deals with uh, the quality um, of a plant and plant propagating um, material. So we have um, declared hemp as an agricultural crop under the Plant Improvement Act, and we have followed um, the, the, the THC uh, content as per, um, in line with the, the SAPRA scheduling. And I know that we, we, we've really had lots of concerns around uh, this 0.2%. And I think uh, Mukhadi has given an indication that there is ongoing discussions to see how um, we can adjust this level, but uh, it needs to be based on uh, existing uh, information under South African production uh, <coughs> environment. So we, we are working on that. So the declaration of, 
of um, hemp as an agricultural crop therefore then provides for um, oversight over the businesses involved, the registration of the varieties in, in the national variety list for a certification scheme of, 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 of seeds involved in, in of hemp seeds, the cultivation of, of hemp itself, and then the author the authorization for the importation of, of, of seed as well as export thereof. I've covered the, the, the point in in if um, this is just um, chair. I'm not going to go into it. What the provisions um, um, cover, but all of these activities aims really to ensure that we have a quality propagating material uh, available within 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 this sector. So um, although chair, we have. Um, the, the, the current legislation provides for um, uh, um, uh, 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 different kinds of, of uh, permits. I will just go into where um, we, I will just go into the hemp cultivation permits itself, um, because I think this is where the crux of, of the oversight is. Um, so this is just the conditions that we've said. I've covered the the THC content and here um, we are not prescribing which laboratory must uh, uh, give a uh, provide a certificate of analysis. The only requirement requirement is is that that certificate must be issued uh, by a SANA's accredited laboratory. And then um, then also the um, the the import authorization must also be granted um, in line with the Agricultural Pest Act in addition to the Plant Improvement Act um, because this is living material. If it's imported, there are concerns around obviously the, the, the pest and disease status of that material. Then um, given the ongoing and existing issues still around the legal uh, space around cannabis, and here I speak about DACA as well as hemp. We we also, in terms of our guideline, we we, we specify that there must be confirmation that um, there is no criminal record uh, attached to the applicant. Then the mal the maximum cultivation area is limited to 50 hectares. Also, an area where we have. Um, where we have had many complaints about, um, but there is no real reason why uh, or scientific reason as to why we've limited it to 50 hectares, merely just to say initially this was our 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 cautious approach in terms of saying we, we're just getting into regulation of hemp. But um, recently there was a a a a, a, an analysis of the existing legal frameworks um, and suggestions around interim uh, measures that can support this industry. And we've agreed that we will um, look at this uh, cultivation limitation in an effort to further support the, the, the industry. Then um, the other condition that we have around cultivation relates, um, relates to um, the that the, the the planting must relate to registered hemp varieties. Um, we we know that at the moment it's only domestically developed uh, uh, varieties. Is only those ones that are from the, the from the Agricultural Research Council. The, these are still in the process of being registered. Um, so there is a provision under the Plant Improvement Act for the importation of unregistered uh, varieties, and most most companies or individuals are making use of this of this provision. But the, the, there's still a question around the local seed that is in circulation. So we we suspect, Chair, that a lot of the existing plantings are happening with uh, seed held over from other activities which people have been involved in for for a long time whether it was legal or not legal um, then there's also a requirement just for the permit holder 
to um, maintain um, uh, uh, um, to, to, to maintain all relevant records. Um, then um, there's this reporting requirement is indicated and when um, there's any breach or when planting needs to happen, the registrar must be in, in, informed and then the permit holder must allow the inspectorate of the department to do its, its inspection. Uh, those those are important um, additional requirements, Chair. Then just briefly, Chair, these are between when we started issuing hemp permits in 20, May 2022 up to end of January this year. We've issued 371 permits um, and uh, the, we, we give the provincial breakdown. It's quite a bit of challenge around um, the, the uh, processing the permit applications because some of the delay um, is um, with with respect to the uh, obtaining the secure the, the police clearances, but we we are continuing our discussions with SAPS to ensure that that happens uh, more expeditiously. Um, Chair. This is just to give you what what we have. The, we have a guideline document that's available. We have draft permits conditions that um, applicants can can look at uh, if it's for research, if it's for sale, for cultivation, for export, and then all the application forms are also available on the department on the department's website and. Um, these can be obtained or you can also just use the this email address hemp uh, dot pia at Dalrat to send your application forms and the 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 office of the registrar responsible for the act is available to to assist applicants uh, we also continuing our discussions with provinces to also help potential um, permit applicants uh, to, to, to comply. Um, and the slide looked clearer on my side, but not now. But this is the contact detail of the officials currently involved in, in, in the system. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Julian, for the presentation. We will address all the questions when we get to Q&A uh, item. For now, we'll move on to the next item of the program, which would be around sustainable and responsible use of cannabis. And the presentation will be done by Mr. Trenton Bech and Mr. Deborah Kopani. The first one will be Mr. Trenton. Over to you, Mr. Trenton. Good morning, Kirk. Can you see my screen? Yes. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I, I run a cannabis and hemp uh, education company. So, you know, we, we are at the forefront of teaching um, students how to operate within the space. Uh, we also work, you know, with commercial farms and commercial farm cultivation. So what we, what we teach in the environment we operate in is very much around standards and trying to make things work for, for all parties. Um, can you see the next slide? Uh, no. Not yet. Oh, there Not we go. Okay. So, so this, uh, um, we, uh, myself and Deborah are both industry uh, uh, people. We've been in the industry for many, many years and on the ground uh, in various different sectors and segments, you know, all the way from government right down to grassroots level. So this is just kind of our perspective on on where things are at and some sort of guidance and thoughts on how things could move forward. Um, you know, as an industry, we, we do support regulation. I think uh, I want to make that very clear. Um, we are dealing with uh, pr products that people ingest, put on their skin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we do need to have standards and regulation to ensure that we protect the, the general public. Um, and so that is something that I think from an industry perspective, we need to make clear that we are not anti-regulation. Um, however, what's very, very important to understand is that, uh, you know, the regulation and standards should not be based on irrational fear. 
Um, you know, we've we've had decades and decades and decades of indoctrination about the negativities about cannabis. Um, for us uh, in the industry, we know that those uh, were all you know uh, lies. Um, you know, and that uh, we we must approach regulation um, with the same um, vigor and 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 and, and view um, based on what we're actually dealing with here. Um, overregulation smothers industries, um, and we can see that uh, from. Uh, our colleagues in, in uh, the sort of state side, 95% um, of commercial farms in California in 2022 last year lost money, um, according to Forbes. Um, that, is a, that is a shocking statistic, and, and one of the major reasons for that is because of overregulation. So um, people have gone back into the illicit markets. Uh, same thing in Canada. You know, Canada destroyed 425 million grams of cannabis last year. Um, there were a number of reasons for that, but one of the reasons was also down to Overregulation, uh, making things too complicated. Um, it's important that we understand that uh, overregulation smother the industry um, and and creates barriers and and pushes people back into the uh, underground market uh, and fuels that. We mustn't forget that no one has ever ever died from cannabis. So the paranoia that uh, we see with regulators globally is completely unfounded. Um, I regularly hear people uh, from, from regulatory bodies and governments say, you know, where, where is the evidence? Um, there is plenty of evidence. Uh, you know, last year there were 2,400 studies on cannabis. Uh, and that's just, just last year. There are, there are thousands and thousands more studies that have been done. So anybody who says there, there isn't evidence uh, needs to read up and, and study. Um, so I think it's very important to understand that uh, overregulation will, have, will cause barriers to us moving forward. And the challenge is, is that we, we certainly have an opportunity here to, to work with the cannabis and hemp industries to have a size, seismic impact on our economy. However, my personal opinion is, is that for that truly to have an impact on our economy, we need to be on a global stage and we need to be competing with the internationals. We already are, have the first mover advantage. We already have a global reputation for cannabis. Um, but, uh, you know, as, uh, as Garth mentioned earlier on, there are other economies coming online. I was recently hosting a panel in Berlin um, and the Thai guys, um, for those, some of you may know, it, you know, Thailand gave a million plants to their, their people and just completely opened the market up. Um, and uh, the Thai guy on my panel stood up and said, you know, we have amazing sun and uh, lots of cheap labor and uh, found myself double taking going, well, that's something that we talk about. So. You know, in order for this to really have the impact that it can on our economy and on our people, we need to be able to play on the global stage. And and regulation at the moment, or lack of it, or the, the sluggish uh, pace that it's moving at, is really, really hurting the competitive advantage. So I think that is something that needs to be factored in whenever we're looking at re re uh, legislation and, and regulation. Um, you know, the, 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 the cannabis industry is, is a complex industry. Uh, it is multifaceted. My personal opinion, um, is within 10 years, if not less, uh, none of us on this call will know anybody who has not interacted with cannabis in some way. And that doesn't mean smoking bongs, um, you know, whether it's topicals, whether it's using uh, hemp oil for cooking, whether it's uh, eating hemp food. I mean, the, 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 the amount of uh, capacitation that is going to happen globally um, is, is massive. And that, and that does bring a level of complexity. Um, you know, essentially, we split the industry into three different sections. Uh, responsible adult use, as we like to call it here, although this, the, the Americans uh, use the word recreational. Um, massive market. Uh, it is, it is uh, in a very gray area at the moment. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the private purposes bill allows um, citizens to, to grow and consume cannabis, but there is no trade uh, at the moment. Industrial ca cannabis is very, very wide, and that is obviously industrial hemp. Um, and that covers a multitude of different industries, building, food, animal feed, I mean, you name it. And so, so in terms of regulation, um, we need to partner with people who oversee those things. If it's to do with uh, bricks, um, then we need to partner with people who are responsible for those particular areas. Um, obviously, we've been through medical, but we can't have a one size fits all strategy. We've got to look at all these different multiple sectors and figure out exactly how we can make it work together. Um, I want to sort of emphasize the fact that, you know, we need African solutions for Africa, without a doubt. And I'm a, I'm a very pro, uh, pro those kind of that approach. However, we really need to learn from other people's mistakes. Um, we need to draw on international experience. There is no time to reinvent the wheel. We cannot sit and wait 
for a year, another two years for this set to happen. And I'm, I'm glad that ASTM came up. I was under the impression, because I didn't see on the, on the first uh, gentleman who spoke on his presentation, ASTM listed, I was under the impression that there was a, uh, an agreement between uh, SABS and between ASTM. Um, as Garth has pointed out, there's a D37 committee. There are already 37 standards on there that could be repurposed and reworked for our local market. Um, I think it's very, very important to understand that um, we are not an international, uh, we are not the same as Germany, we are not the same as America. Um, those regulations have been driven by their clim climatic conditions, having to grow um, indoor. Um, as Garth said earlier, there is absolutely no reason why we cannot grow medicine outdoor in South Africa. Um, and so while I do really believe in taking uh, and learning from other people's mistakes, we need to create uh, African solutions for our market um, and not be afraid. At the moment, it's the tail wagging the dog. I, I have a vision for, for a future where we, we create land race strains, we grow it under our conditions uh, that we have determined, and we are competent enough to take that out to the world and stand uh, tall with what we can actually do in this country. We, we have some incredible cannabis in this country and some very, very emerging uh, experience and, and have an opportunity to really put our place on the map. But overregulation will kill the industry. So we support it, but it needs to be well managed. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Tebojo, who's going to sort of unpack some of the areas that we feel need a bit of attention. Over to you, Tebojo. Um, thank you so much, mate. Um, and, um, you know, just uh, before I jump into that, Bayamuti uh, was founded uh, about seven years ago. Uh, by myself, we are pretty much the only within, you know, the industry's concern that are looking at holistically the entire plant as a medicine as well as of uh, cannabis uh, as well. Um, and I think one of the key things that um, uh, my colleague has mentioned is is the overregulation. It's it's the killer of everything that we are doing now. Keeping in mind that um, you know all small, pretty much businesses that are running on complementary medicine at the moment are pretty much all small, without obviously mentioning some of the big guys. So with the uh, overarching of over-regulation, you're looking at a serious diminishing number of these companies, uh, and that means that you know we're going to suffer when it comes to job creation uh, and job losses uh, in numbers. And that has been demonstrated over the years through the over-regulation that we see uh, with our colleagues at SAPRA when it comes to uh, enforcing some of the rules that require that each and every uh, compl complementary medicine uh, uh, manufacturer or even subcontractor for that matter that you know not necessarily manufacturing has to have a responsible pharmacist. Now I don't know if you know this it costs about 60,000 rand to have a responsible pharmacist on your on your on your on your salary bill. Now that 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 caters for plus minus five jobs so you know that you would have created. So I think these are kind of examples that you see that are just, you know, uh, uh, destroying what we're trying to do. At the same time, we do acknowledge the fact that we must have some sort of regulation. Um, as uh, Trenton has said, that we are ingesting these products, we are putting them in our skin, but it has to be done within reasonable uh, way as much as possible. Keeping in mind, again, that most of these companies that are selling these products are not necessarily manufacturing them themselves. They are some subcontracted at SAPRA approved GMP facilities. So that alone gives you know, the assurances to consumers that these products are made in a proper environment. Um, so when you come, when you look at the issue of testing, which is quite key for what we do, because one of the key things is that if you're gonna ingest something, you have to test uh, if there is heavy metal in it and, and so forth and so on. Uh, the use of pesticides is completely not, not allowed because we're making that into an oil. Now, when you, you know, transform this uh, biomass into oil, you are literally just, you know, increasing whatever that's there tenfold. In, so it's important that we do testing. And these tests are conducted at reputable testing labs. Uh, Cure is one of them. Uh, NAFs, which we've been using for years and years, it is. It's also one of those uh, labs, and there's many of them that are popping up. Uh, so when you're looking at SABS with regards to obviously looking at the issue of standard within the testing itself, looking at how they are done, and and probably you know making sure that that standard is the same across the board. Uh, the monogram, which is, you know, coming to the point where we are now putting standard in terms of making sure that everything that it's, 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 it's out there, uh, it has some sort of a, a, a tick to say that this and that and that and the other has been done. 
Now, when it comes to complementary medicine, that is in relative terms, it's within the umbrella of the Department of Health, uh, which then means that, you know, all these products are actually made in a GMP facility that is APRA approved. So that kind of take care of that. Uh, but there are other things that we find that they might slip off uh, or, you know, or slip through the, 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 the holes, which we looking at edibles and cosmetics. Now, um, with, with, within SAPRA is concerned, um, based on the guidelines, there shouldn't be a, a CBD or a cannabis, you know, a, a der derivative inside a, 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 a food substance or a cosmetics. Uh, but that's funny because the president during SONA has said that these are the things that should happen. And these are the things that that's, that's been happening. So the question is, who has then the jurisdictions if SAPRA does not have a jurisdictions in food and cosmetics? And that's where enter SABS, I think, in a case of making a standard there to make sure that we follow all the relevant uh, uh, standard in producing these edibles, in making sure that these products are in there. Because we cannot assume that, uh, you know, if we say it's not supposed to be there, that it won't be there. As we speak, there's CBD water, there's CBD gummies, there's CBD tea all over the place. Um, so those standard has to be in place so that we can manage all, all those things. Product packaging is also quite important. Certain products, they need to be obviously uh, kept away from kids. So it's important that the packaging has a, some sort of a child lock of some sort, depending on, you know, when we're moving now towards things like recreational or adult, responsible adult use. Uh, these, again, actives are put in gummies. Uh, so these gummies are loved both by kids and adults. So it's important that we make sure that these things are kept safe for my little ones. Ingredients is one of the most important thing. Um, if we are dealing with natural products, it's important that that becomes the case. And the listing on ingredients must be able to detail all those things so that we know exactly what's inside the, the package. Um, some of these things that we mentioned, you may think that they're not necessary, uh, but cases that have come out and even countries that have been doing this for longer than us, there were instances where there was even minuscule amount of CBD in these products or non-existent for whatever. Uh, in some of them. So it's important that we, we make sure that these products, when they go out there, that they are, uh, 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 the ingredients are put in place in a proper manner and are clear. Um, as the chairman of the Cannabis Soil Association, you know, uh, we, 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 we always, uh, you know, uh, emphasize with our, with our members to make sure that these are the guidelines that they must follow in making sure that we put our best foot forward. Uh, to, to, to make sure that these products are, are, are healthy and safe for consumers to use. Uh, when you're looking at things like nutrients and mediums, again, you know, we are, we are talking about a plant that we should not use any um, uh, 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 herbicides and pesticides or anything that has to be doing with heavy metal. There are places where you can, you know, plant these, 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 these plants. I mean, cannabis is, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an amazing plant that can do a whole lot of rehabilitation on land. Uh, even, you know, uh, your, your old uh, closed up uh, gold mines and, and various different mines that are out there that you can't plant anything. You can use cannabis to actually rehabilitate that land. Now, what happened is that everything that it finds in, this, in, in, the, in the soil, it actually is able to suck it up into the plant itself. So we can't use that plant, for example, for, for, for cosmetics or for, um, uh, uh, for, for, for medicine or anything that you can ingest because it's going to be toxic. So it's important that those kind of plants are obviously are labeled and clearly marked on that the fact that they can be used for paper or any other thing that's not going to be ingested. So when it comes to the nutrients, it's important that these nutrients, whether it's all live organisms or all those kind of things that people use, that there must be a standard adhered to that will make sure that they are safe. Um, second part of that is that from an SABS point of view, it's, it, it would be a great idea that you can partner with organizations like ourselves as the Cannabis Trade Association, as well as Friends of Hemp. These are industry players, association that's been around for quite some time that can help with the guideline and guiding on how our proper ways and measures to follow, because we've been doing these things. Our members have been doing these things. And these are the, uh, you know, the kind of behavior that we've been very much uh, uh, trying to make sure that everybody follows and everybody makes sure that, you know, we get to the point where we're providing proper services and products to consumers that are not gonna obviously be uh, health risks for them. 
Um, so on that note, uh, if you're looking at uh, the issue of IP and so forth and so on, I think that's where, again, uh, it will be quite critical for, you know, SABS to put on, on, on those standards that are there. Um, and then you can be able to assist uh, everybody else to be able to say, okay, guys that are doing edibles, these are the standards we should be looking at. Guys that are in cosmetics, these are the standards we'll be looking at. Next week, we'll be doing another discussion with, with how thing regarding some of these things. And I've said to them, look, let's invite everyone within the industry is concerned, guys are in food, the guys are in cosmetics, you know, guys are in medicine, guys are into uh, construction and all of this because everyone involved, it's, it's, it's an entire value chain. And this is a massive opportunity for us which we think that, you know, everyone will be able to benefit from that. Um, education is dry, it's, it's, it's key. So I think SABS will be great in terms of pushing this education to the public, in terms of saying, look at this sign, if you see this sign, you know that this product is, is, is good to consume uh, and so forth and so on, or use in, in whatever grow uh, you, 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 you have. I mean, if you look at with our, with the, with the, our ability or the, 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 the constitutional court giving us their rights to, to grow our own cannabis. Everybody's growing cannabis in their homes, those that have space to do so. So what are they using to, to fertilize if there's anything and, and where do they get it from and what standard is it at? So these are the things that I think, you know, they'll be key in terms of public participation, public education, which is expensive, but you know, uh, with your budget, I'm sure we can, we can, we can achieve that. Is there another slide, uh, Trenton? All right, so uh, that's it from us. Uh, thank you guys so, so much. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to shout. Thank you, uh, Deborah and Tretton for the presentation. Um, just want to check the program quickly. This was uh, the last item on the program in terms of the presentations that were given. We are now left with the Q&A session, and then there will be a summary and closure. But before we do the Q&A session, I am aware that the session was planned until half past 11, and we didn't um, have a tea break or leg stretch in between, but that was mainly because it was scheduled for like two hours. That's why we didn't include that. But looking at the time now, I would like to propose that we take a five minutes leg stretch before we go to Q&A session so that we can yeah, have that five minutes break before we deal with the questions, which I believe are many, but we only have 15 minutes to deal with that. But hopefully we'll be done by 12 on or before 12. So we'll now take a five minute break, then we'll be back at 11.35 to continue with the, the program. Thank you.
Hi everyone, I trust that we are all back. I already see a hand from Radia, but Veronica, could you please assist me with the hands that are raised and also the questions that are posted in the chat box? Uh, maybe if you can record the hands as per the time that they are raised so that we can start with the first ones and go that way. Uh, I'll hand over to Veronica to assist me with the hands. You can, can just let me know who's the first one. Then we'll take the hands, then we'll go to the q and A. I mean the, the chat box to check the questions posted there. Let's start with the hands first. Veronica, are you back? Hi, Folen. I, I can assist you for now. Um, okay. The first one, yeah, the first one would be Radia and, and followed by Nomvola and Glass. Okay, thanks, Tabo. Radia, over to you. We had uh, three, four presentations where the questions were not uh, taken. Now is the time for each one of you to raise those questions to the speakers. So Radia, over to you with your question. Thank you, Ms. Pelang, and greetings to the SABS team and all the participants. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, so I would just like to touch on some of what was said um, by Daphne, by Garth Strachan, Julian Jafta, Trenton, and Tevoko. Um, so with reference to the INCB, I guess that we as South Africa are a member country and, you know, South Africa has also 
played a big role in the war on drugs. Obviously, cannabis has been misrepresented as the poster child for this war on drugs. And a lot of it is rooted in racism and apartheid. So Daphne was making a lot of reference to the legislative environment. And she mentioned um, years like 1961 and 1965. And, you know, as Garth touched on, there has to be some legislative reform, you know, and there's been a lot of back and forth over standardization versus regulation. But what I feel should be at the center of this is reparation. When you start with the legitimate owners of the crop, that is where we should begin to work our way back. Um, we've also had a lot of interdepartmental relationships um, from the very beginning. Um, Garth mentioned that he began the process three years ago. Um, I think it's actually five years because our first meeting was in 2018 with regard to standardization and, you know, holding space for the traditional healers because SABS has standards in place for ancient Ayurvedic med medicine, which originates in India, um, ancient traditional Chinese medicine. So, so traditional African medicine has to hold a place within SABS. And I would encourage um, those on this call to please find a way to be part of uh, Bruce Imbedzi's traditional healer summit, which will be on the 23rd and 24th of this month at the Birchwood Hotel. And we actually need to create the space because we come from a place of legitimacy. And then also just to touch on what Trenton said, he mentioned three sectors, um, but since the development of CDC SA, we've classed it into six sectors, which are farming, fiber, extraction, nutraceutical, medical, and responsible adult use. So um, on behalf of BAFASA and the ACIA, we are willing to be part of these forums. We have had a huge amount of interdepartmental relationships with every sector of government, with SAPRA. And, you know, SAPRA has admitted that they do not cover the ambit of the traditional healers. And we have to find a way to be able to standardize outside of SAPRA's le uh, regulatory scope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Radia. I, I take that as a comment, no, not a question, but uh, if maybe Garth would like to come in or any of the speakers just to, to, to say something on what you've commented on, you are more than welcome to do so. Garth, Dr. Uh -huh. Julian. No, I mean, I think Radia's comments uh, aren't really questions, but they're very positive yeah. contributions. I mean, you know, uh, it probably falls outside of my my contract, but uh, unquestionably, uh, traditional growers were hounded by apartheid, even executed in some cases. And so, you know, the whole... Um, criminalization of cannabis uh, was unquestionably a colonial apartheid uh, project. I think the key question now is how do we reverse the process and get this sector up and running with enabling regulation and standards and so on and so forth in a complex environment, as I said, involving many departments. And the critical question is to ensure that traditional African communities and farmers with indigenous knowledge capabilities are mainstreamed in this process. We can't have a situation where we're adopting a defensive posture which says, we're only going to uh, regulate for uh, export demand pathways for, uh, you know, um, constrained um, 
uh, export of uh, cannabis and cannabis derivatives. Uh, and then, you know, the second thing is I'm completely unable to understand how and why SAPRA should be regulating the hemp plant. Um, uh, you know, and I think somebody on the chat asked the question, uh, which, where in the acts does uh, this, is this uh, validated? Where, which part of the act says that SAPRA should be uh, regulating primary production of, of an agricultural crop, which uh, Dr. Jafter clearly said hemp is a agricultural crop. So I'm making the point that uh, we have to really get the regulation and standards in place and work together and move away from uh, with respect to very defensive postures. Thank you. Thank you, Garth. I see a hand from, hi, hi, Matale. Yeah, somehow I'm unable to raise my hand. This icon for some reason is not working for me. Um, maybe just a quick comment on the last, uh, 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 I think it was for, from Radia, the comments that she made. Also just to contribute to that to say, we have been listening actually as the SABS and we've been doing our best to accommodate, obviously based on where we come from as a country. Uh, we do have a committee, Radia, I'm not sure if you're participating in it, that deals with issues of traditional, African traditional medicine. We started as part of the Chinese traditional medicine that we then transformed our local committee into African traditional medicine. And then just to show that we, we, we don't just pay lip service to that. We were able to accommodate as much as we can. First to show respect to the traditional customs and practices obviously within the framework of standardization, where even when our stakeholders, who most of them were traditional healers, uh, traditional practitioners, when we hosted them for meetings and they wanted to maybe start the meeting in the way they understand how, like maybe calling on the ancestors, we will give them space to beat the drums, to do all of that. That's just to show how we are accommodating them. But that's just one thing of saying we need to then have that respect, obviously, within the framework of what we do as the SABS as an organization. That even when coming to systems that we use, uh, like most of the participants here who could be participating, some of our committees or have participated, they know that there was a time when we transitioned from how we used to communicate, how we used to interact with our stakeholders that we then moved to a system called iSolution and so on. But we then had, based on the feedback that we got from that particular African Traditional Medicine Committee where they said, based on our composition and how we do things, can you accommodate us? And we did accommodate them somehow where there was an exclusion. Uh, Chairperson, may I maybe just respond to other just two things very quickly. Uh, I also wanted to maybe just go back to SAPRA with the issue of regulation of cultivation. Because if memory serves me well, when the Constitutional Court then made that ruling, that declaration regarding privacy of citizens, that I'm, I'm able to use cannabis in my private space. They also touched on the issue of how much I'm able to cultivate for my own private use. And I can't remember, I think it was three plants or trees, whatever you call them, but it was not much because they, there was the argument that if you exceed that, then you're becoming more like a producer, a dealer or whatever. And I want to just get a comment from Sapra and maybe from Dalrat as well. Because I noticed in the presentation by Dr. Shafta that he did touch on the issue of cultivation and that you are allowed to go for 50 hectares. But his presentation was mainly around hemp. And I just want to make sure or at least check if that extends to cannabis as well. 
whether your reference to hemp will include cannabis that the one who wants to plant can go to to plant cannabis can go to 50 hectares and maybe just uh, on the on the sapra as well to say but that function which the question was asked and i didn't really get the clear answer to say but which part of the act allows them to do that is that not a police function that if in my backyard i've got a plantation there of cannabis that it is the police function to then say i'm breaking the law and do what they need to do so that would be my question <clears throat> then just on you know the last speaker Tevoko, in his presentation just to confirm for you Tevoko, in the forum that indeed we do have a, an agreement with astm uh, for the adoption of their documents so that's why in my presentation i made reference to say as soon as the technical committee is established the first thing that we'll ask them to do because we have also realized that ASTM is actually have done a lot of work around this area. Now to avoid reinventing the wheel, we will then ask the technical committee to review, to review those publications because some of them you might say, well, they're good for us. Some of them you might say, actually they won't be applicable in our country, but we're gonna use the agreement that we have in place with, the, with ASTM to allow the committee to do that work. Then uh, my last one, was just on, I think that was the question that came in uh, Mr. Strachan's presentation around what support would the CBS need to get the technical committee going. I think we've now come a long way. I think we are at the tail end of getting this committee going because as the program director said that after this program, the membership forms will be sent to everybody who's here. So as soon as we receive the, the 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 responses then we'll be able to start the committee and get it going even if not everybody has agreed but if we could get at least a balanced committee to start the work going for example if we get get then maybe we'll point to some of them if Sabra could be there uh, Dalrat could be there as the main call them regulators then we could then accommodate other organizations other uh, 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 bodies into this committee. We will then get it going. Uh, and may, uh, I guess we 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 did explain previously what the the delay has been about. We were not getting the right kind of responses. But I think we are just we are just there. It's just a, a matter of time. And my estimation is, if we can get the responses as quickly as possible, by March we will get the committee going. Thanks very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Matali. I think you've you've covered like conclusion part already, <laughs> summary and conclusion at once. But thank you for your comments and your responses. I'm not sure if Julian, Dr. Julian, would like to respond to some of the the questions that you've posed to him. Dr. Julian, you had your hand raised just after um, Matali. Do you still want to come in? Yes. Chair, I actually dropped a comment um, and I hope uh, uh, it's the question that you're referring to. Uh, I dropped a comment indicating that DARA does not issue any permits for, for, for DACA, although the speaker referred to cannabis. Uh, I'm, I'm understanding was that he's referring to, to, to DACA. So that 50 hectare uh, limitation or um, Cultivation limit is only, we only spoke about uh, hemp because remember that is what our declaration uh, under the Plant Improvement Act uh, refers to. And yeah, so so that's that's the question that I picked up, Chair, unless I've missed um, some something else. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Julian Jafta. Uh, Veronica and Tavo. Could you please assist with the hands, outstanding hands? Tabo? Hi, uh, Fallen, we still have Nomvola. Okay, Nomvola, over to you. Thank you very much, ma'am. And, and thank you to the, to the presenters uh, for this informative uh, presentations. I am speaking as a a, a, a colleague from Department of Small Business Development. And um, our interest really is on the, 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 
the level of uh, empowerment of, of SMMEs, cooperatives, but especially women, youth, and persons with disabilities, you know, in, in terms of uh, licensing. And, and my, my specific question, uh, ma'am, is, is the breakdown on, on this 87 licenses which were issued by SAPRA, and in the 371 which the permits which were issued by 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 Dalrat, I, I would like to know what is the breakdown in terms of uh, the gender the race the, the geographic spread meaning township and rural uh, 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 and, and 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 which ones of those are if you, you are able to give us which ones of those are, are, are cooperatives and so on. And I'll tell you why, you know, in the rural areas, uh, uh, especially uh, um, we have um, quite a number of cooperatives who are involved in the cultivation and, and so on of, 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 of hemp. So we'd want to, to understand to what extent are they uh, receiving receiving or have they been empowered with either licenses or, 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 or permits to cultivate uh, a, a, a hemp. And I'm also happy uh, to hear from Dr. Jafta that uh, Dalrat is reviewing the, the 50 hectares uh, 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 limits for, 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 for hemp uh, um, uh, 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 cultivation. But but directly to 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 Sapra, I'm not sure, man. I, I might be mistaken, but I I got a, a sense that Sapra seemed to be, you know, more inclined towards um, the international standards, uh, and 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 not uh, looking really at the. The, the South African dynamics, the South African realities. I think some of the issues were raised uh, uh, rightfully so by, by, by Gareth that we have historical cultivators, we have historical producers who happen to be uh, uh, in the far flung areas, some of whom cannot even afford uh, uh, you, you know the 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 the, the costs that goes with uh, uh, licensing, getting permits, and so on. You know, to to what extent are we enabling the regulatory space so that they are also uh, uh, included in this whole process? And I also agree with Tebu for that. Um, you you know that over regulations, over regulating may may push. Uh, uh, this historical uh, 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 cultivator towards illicit uh, 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 operation because uh, you you know uh, we 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 were the, the country was excited really when when there was uh, 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 the, 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 the 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 that court ruling but, but but now it looks like come implementation there are barriers which are further limiting uh, the participation of the historically uh, marginalized and yet historical uh, 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 participants in the in the in the hemp and 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 and, and cannabis space and lastly chairperson i would wish to to see uh, the 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 you know during the at the establishment of this technical committee, we we hope that it will be fairly representative and not only put in people who are are able to 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 be reached through uh, your 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 media and, and 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 emails and so on. There are people who are in the traditional medicine space. There are women in rural areas. There are young people. There are people with disabilities who have an interest and who have been participating in the space. May they also be allowed to be to have representatives on this a, a technical committee and the process of establishing this committee should uh, at least be open and transparent. I think in, 
and the deputy that you spoke about transparency. That process may it be transparent and 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 and, and allow for 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 all stakeholders to at least have representation. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks, uh, Nomvula, for for the questions. Unfortunately, we don't have Dalrat and Sapra in the room. They they have left the meeting they, due to other commitments. But uh, if you can maybe send your questions in writing to Veronica and Tavo, and that will be will be forwarded to Dalrat and uh, Sapra as they have uh, promised to 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 respond to all the questions that will be forwarded to them even after the, the session. And to respond to your last uh, comment on making sure that the process for establishment of the committee is transparent and we have the relevant stakeholders in the committee, yeah, that will be taken care of. When we establish our technical committees, we, we make sure that uh, the process is, is, is open and transparent, and we also make sure that we have a balanced stakeholder in the in the committee. So that will be taken care of. You, you don't have to worry about it. We are left with uh, two minutes before 12 o'clock, which I've earlier said uh, this session will be will end at 12 or before 12. So when looking at the time now is 11.58, which means we are left with two minutes. So I'm just going to hand over to Tretton to, to ask the question quickly or to respond to the questions asked, and then I will close the session. Over to you, Tretton. Uh, so I'll keep it very brief, but it does kind of follow on from the previous speaker. I think what's imperative is that SABS um, approaches with a, a large degree of independence you know what we what we mustn't forget is that the cannabis and hemp industries are, are is one of the most disruptive industries of our time. Um, there are big uh, you know conglomerates that uh, are afraid for it to come online because of market share. It's the pharma industry, the plastics industry, cotton industry, petrochemical industry, um, and standards should not be dictated by these industries who have other agendas. Now their agendas are to slow things down for as long as possible. Because because of the disruption to their traditional methods. So I think it's very important that uh, this, this, uh, this committee that's set up is, is very representative um, and is drawing uh, upon the cannabis community who have deep experience in the space to set standards. So I just wanted to leave, leave uh, you with that. And thank you so much for the session today. Thank you, Tratton. Uh, Veronica, do we have any questions in the chat box? before I officially close the session. Tabo, anything else from? Here, can, um, I, can I just come in, please? Yes, uh, Mr. Stratton. Uh, and I'm not Mr. It's Garth. Um, <laughs> The, I, I think there's a very important point that's been made, which uh, it's a pity that Delred and Sepra have left the room. But, you know, we're issuing all these licenses and permits on the supply side, and I think we might be encouraging a big market failure. The data of those permits and licenses has to be mined. Apart from questions of representativity, they're all the questions of the economic questions which um, need to be answered in terms of offtake agreements and so on and so forth. So I think uh, arising from the conclusions of this meeting, we must make that point. I just want to make uh, another point. I think we must seriously avoid sitting here again in three years' time as we are doing now, talking about the technical committee and the requirement for standards. And so the balance between representativity, which is absolutely important, and the kind of technical expertise in the technical committee is very important. And I'm happy to help with people who can serve suggestions of people who can serve on a technical committee, uh, which might not be in this room, uh, so that we actually 
uh, you know, are very strategic about the technical committee. And I would want to suggest that, you know, there's actually timelines put to this work so that it's not a kind of interminable process. Uh, standards are required really urgently. And um, uh, so, so we've got to approach the work uh, with great urgency from the project management office in the presidency, uh, obviously working with uh, Tabo and Peter and other colleagues. I'm happy as and where appropriate to give support. Thank you. Thank you, Garth. We will definitely uh, take this project uh, as a matter of agency. From now going forward, the membership forms will be circulated, obviously, to all the stakeholders that have joined the sessions today and those that couldn't make it to the session. Thereafter, this committee will be established, provided we get positive feedback from the stakeholders that are in this platform, because if they don't respond, then that's where our challenge comes, because then we cannot proceed with the establishment of a committee when we don't have interested stakeholders to join the committee. But hopefully, looking at the number of the participants that have joined this session today, I'm hopeful that we will be able to establish a well-balanced committee going forward and to develop the standards thereof. So this brings us to the end of our session and thank you very much for all the participants who have joined the session. And thanks to all the speakers for the information shared with us today. And uh, a way forward, as I had said earlier, it will be for the circulation of the membership forms. Veronica and Tabo will circulate the membership forms to all of you so that you can complete and send back to them. Then the process for establishment of the committee will unfold thereof. So thank you, thank you very much. And thanks to the SEPS team for, for, for organizing this event beyond Veronica Tabo. Matali and all other SEPS uh, colleagues who have assisted in the preparation. And yeah, all, all of you, thank you. Thank you very much for your attendance. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a pleasant one. Thank you. Thank you.